You guys ready to start? Not yet? How are you guys doing? Where are you from? Quit talking. Um, how's everybody doing? I had talked to someone from Tyler. That could be the farthest away. Anybody can beat Tyler as far as coming? You win, you win the award for coming from Tyler. Thank you for coming this far. So uh, welcome to Buildings and Brew. Uh, thank you to Windsor and uh, Kukin and Rockwolf for sponsoring these. Uh, they're paying for the beer, so say here, here. Thank you. Um, does anybody own a Tudor home? Few people. Um, are you here because you want to know more about Tudor homes? Sure, sure. sure. Um, well, this is kind of a new series uh, that I'm going to start. That's going to uh, dig into the details of building. And I hope it works. <laughs> May not work. Um, the uh, we're we're going to just kind of geek out to details, okay? And um, we're going to talk about. Uh, building better and how to do that and you know what I see out there is um, you know people building uh, you know spending a lot of money on a house today and thinking they have the details right but really don't and um, I think that's because a lot of the way we approach architecture and building is very different than we used to in the 20s and 30s so um, we're going to talk about that and Hopefully, as I dive into all these details and talk about how these things were made, you'll understand this divide that's happening in building today and kind of how we got to get back to the way we used to build. So, um, talking about the Tudor style, uh, everybody know the Tudor period. Um, the Tudors were, you know, this is Tudor. Uh, this is from the Tudor period, I should say. Um, when we are building Tudor houses, it's not always like this, right? Um, I think we get afraid to build uh, authentically like this. Um, but the Tudors, it's, it's, it's like from 1483 to 1603, and then James, that's why it's called J Jacobean or Jacobian, however you want to pronounce it, was after the Tudor era. So the Tudor dynasty, okay, Elizabeth is part of the Tudor dynasty, Elizabethan architecture. She's part of that Tudor uh, era. And so when we talk about, you know, Tudor revival and Tudor styles, it's really a uh, amalgamation of different styles and, and, and things. It really, in my mind, it means kind of that medieval type of building that's, uh, that's English, um, that has, uh, you know, typically timber framed uh, paneled walls that, you know, specifically you know, wood paneled walls. I meant to tell you guys, uh, if you want to geek out to a wall, we built that sample wall in there, which is a Tudor wall. Uh, and there's a bunch of different details in there. If you want to kind of geek out and look at different panel profiles, there's a bunch of different ones in there. Um, a lot of, you know, this talk started out kind of the English influence and as I dug deeper into it. Uh, I blew off the early stuff and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a different the colonial revival thing but if we just look at the you know English reign and the English things we get a lot of our uh, architecture from Britain uh, certainly we call it the Victorian era Victorian architecture ours isn't doesn't start in 1837 but it is kind of 1860s 1870s into the early 1900s obviously the Georgian era now, there's a number of Georgian kings ours is kind of 1740 to uh, right after the, uh, the, the Revolutionary War. Um, and so, but we're talking about this era here. And so under the Tudor, Tudor dynasty, you have uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, um, Stuart, and then the Jacobean era. And so this is what we're talking about, um, this period of time. Um, this is kind of Elizabethan architecture. Um, you know, you'll, you'll start to see 
realized what there were 1500s in England. Uh, remember the Renaissance in Italy starts in this, about the same period. And you see uh, stable, world stabilization taking place. And so there's the technology that's happening and we see it in the buildings. One of the things in particular is the glass. Um, they were never able to do glass walls like this. And it's in the Elizabethan period, you begin to see that. And you'll see that um, those, those glass walls as a, um, you know, done this way in very nice houses and then done differently in these, in these uh, wood houses. But uh, the Jacobean period, 1603, 1625, this is sometimes called Jacobethan because it, they're very similar to the Elizabethan houses. Uh, it's just a little bit later period. Um, and then, you know, you see these kind of, this is a famous one, it's called Little Molten Hall. Um, but again, you see a lot of glass in here um, and, you know, that glass technology and being able to make glass affordably, make glass, um, uh, you know, consistently well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about glass, but look at the difference between the glass and these things and the size of the panes versus the size of the panes in these. The reason why these panes are so small is because of how they're making the glass. And, um, you know, these people are kind of showing off that they've got big pieces of glass, whereas in the simple everyman houses, they're, you know, this big. And so it has to do, glass is very expensive. Uh, they taxed houses based on the amount of glass. Certainly they did that in Charleston. So anyway, you've seen a, uh, a rise in the, uh, um, the technology of building brickwork as well. And we'll talk about brickwork, but, uh, you know, firing bricks, making bricks, molded bricks, all that kind of things are very much a part of this era. Um, I mean, these are certainly charming, uh, crazy houses. You're seeing uh, in details like, uh, see it on this screen, where you're seeing the, the rise of the skill of the carpenter and, you know, this kind of decoration and not necessarily, uh, you know, mandatory for the the building of this of this structure but kind of a showing the craftsman's hand um, as he you know decorates and does up these timber frames like this and so um, again world stabilization trade taking place uh, rising wealth of the individual uh, rising uh, skill of the craftsman and you begin to see that expressed in the architecture uh, the inside, we'll, we'll look at a bunch of the inside, um, but they're, they're very rustic. You see the paneled walls here. Um, certainly the mantle becomes very important. This heraldry and uh, the, the kind of work that goes over, um, over the mantle is very important. Uh, kind of a show-off space. Uh, the garden would have been added later. But uh, anyway, th so we're talking about that period. If you look at it uh, all over England, okay, there's a number of areas uh, that uh, you see more of it, right? And so certainly out in the country, this is the Cotswolds. Um, thatch roofs is something that, that in the 20s and 30s, they try to copy and match with wood and with other materials. Um, but, you know, the size of the windows, the casements primarily, plank doors, uh, certainly the gardens very important. but this architecture is popular and is still popular because it is charming. There is a clear narrative that is taking place um, and we want to go inside there. We want to, you know, sit by the fire in these, in these things. We'd like to work in the gardens. And so they're romantic houses and um, certainly very appealing. Um, driving through the Cotswolds, there's, there's towns. Um, not only are the individual houses, but the way the towns are put together, they're, you know, they're uh, idyllic, right? Um, it takes you back to a simpler place in time. Um, we're gonna be looking at the building materials and kind of how to, how to do this, but um, there's a reason why it's so popular. Um, and, and what I really want on, on, on our journey today is to become uh, really good at looking at the details. Um, even, you know, the way this has been repaired with brick, um, and you know, you'll see sometimes on these houses, a mix of brick and stone, 
Um, and so, you know, where does that come from? That we're looking back at old buildings like this and seeing how they weave that together. Um, and they're, they're used to the stone materials, the, the, the scale and the proportion of all the parts and pieces are, are lovely. And so um, they're, they're, there's a lot to like here and it's no wonder that we're kind of uh, uh, drawn to it. In America, really, you're looking at a period of about 1890 to 1940. Um, this is a house in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and, you, and you see, in the Victorian period, you never really see pure things. It's always a mix of different styles. But this is kind of, you, you might be called it carpenter gothic. There's certainly gothic things there. But the, the use of timber and the use of uh, timber framing to show off uh, the structure this is probably 1925 uh, here, that's here in Fort Worth. Um, but this period of time, 1890 to 1940, predominantly it's, it's 1920 to 1940. Um, Virginia McAllister in her book says that the Tudor revival is the most popular house style in America, 1920, 1930. After 1930, the colonial revival kind of takes over, but those two, um, are the two most popular house styles in America. So there, there, there is something about these styles that we are attracted to. And there was, in reading about this, there was a number of different theories about this. I didn't, wasn't buying all of them, but uh, um, it's very interesting because it was very popular. Um, part of the stuff, and, and you may remember this when we were talking about the period revival architecture, because we go from Victorian to arts and crafts to period revival. Um, period revival, part of the reason it's happening is because um, of World War I and uh, people going, particularly architects going over to England before, during and after the war um, to study the architecture. And so there was uh, a number of books put out in the 20s. Uh, Samuel Chamberlain wrote a number of them on French, France, <laughs> France and England. Uh, going around drawing these buildings, recording where these buildings are, uh, you know, taking uh, drawings of, of these buildings and then selling them back in the United States. So it became a, uh, you know, there was a rediscovery that took place certainly in the 20s and 30s. Here's a few houses in Fort Worth that, um, you know, do a, a good job, certainly compared to the houses that are built today. Um, some of these are really good and, you know, just how they're put together, they're, um, the copying and the details of how uh, they do just the timber work in this one, the brick work in between the timbers, um, very good. I don't know if you knew Frank Lloyd Wright did a Tudor Revival house. Uh, this was in Oak Park. It's right near his studio. This was a remodel he did. Um, and you can see the Frank Lloyd Wright influence here in this in the decoration, certainly in this you know plane that he that that, that fireplace he's put in there, um, but he also did some uh, Tudor revival things. This kind of thing is is his typical type of decoration. Um, I'm I'm saying that kind of in jest, right? It's not a pure Tudor revival, but but it is speaking to how popular that style was. This is early 1900s. This was a Tudor Revival house that he remodeled, put his prairie spin on it. Um, and in all different price points, right? From the very wealthy um, to the middle class to the simpler houses, um, the Tudor Revival style shows itself uh, in all these different platforms and all these different places. <clears throat> Talked about John Staub a while ago. Certainly he was one of those architects who went back to Europe uh, studied the European buildings, actually saw this parapeted top uh, while he was going around in the 20, 24, 25, um, and came back and designed this house in Fort Worth. Uh, we were lucky to work on, and, uh, but that was all part of that same revival and that same spirit. Now, this is 1928, this is 1978, okay? See any difference there? <laughs> So we've, we've forgotten how to do it, and, and uh, certainly we're not practicing it as well. And I think part of that is just not you know, studying the details and understanding what's going on. There is a, I don't know if you find me on Instagram, um, there was a designer who did this house and uh, did the flipper thing on it where 
she colored things blue and she did all kinds of weird things to it. And I was just like, well, if you just, this is actually, this house wants to be a Tudor revival house. Um, and it's not, <laughs> um, but why isn't it? And so I started breaking out all the deals. Um, you know, the, the wagon wheel, you know, uh, uh, gable end there. Um, and so what I did was I drew over top of it this, uh, the details that work. I mean, this little thing, that's a Colonial Revival entry, right? What's it doing on this house? And so you don't have a door with side lights, and that's a bad door with side lights, right, and on, on this house. And so we've gone back with a plank door. Uh, certainly the amount of timbering was just, it's, it's just uh, sparse. And so you'll notice I've gone back with a lot more timbering, a lot more, you know, kind of eclectic t timbering. Um, change the windows from these plate glass windows to kind of a smaller casement window. Most of the windows are casement. I've got, you know, leaded glass here with the kind of some heraldry in the, there. I've changed this arch to that four centered arch, which is what you'll see of the, uh, the uh, uh, garage doors, gone to a carriage style garage door. So, you know, this kind of paneling, which is, you know, classical federal colonial revival, you know, I've gone back with a carriage style door. So there are ways to get better right at, at building in this style if we'll look at the original details. And certainly that first house where you saw that timbering everywhere and you think about this, you realize, yeah, they just didn't, they don't have enough. And so copying and understanding what those details are really can make a big difference um, on how it looks. Okay, so um, looking at the past, okay, I, there's a house I visited in England called Dorney Court. Um, an amazing house. It is, uh, they have, back here, they have a church from the Saxon period, okay? That would be like 500, okay? So really old. Um, really weird, eclectic building, but for the most part, Tudor, okay? And incredibly charming, incredibly interesting and varied. Um, this is their attempt at the Elizabethan front, right, that you will see inside. Uh, but certainly the timbering and, and all the work they were doing there, this is the inside. Um, we've got this, this kind of ma main hall, this kind of paneling on this end of the wall. We got linen fold paneling on the other end of the wall. That's the window I was just showing you that was right there. Um, so this window is that window right there. Um, you see the way the light comes into this room. There's even a Georgian room on this house. And so you're, you're seeing this narrative I always talk about in this story that this family had this house and they wanted to do a remodel in the you know, early 1700s. And you know, they take this English Tudor house, which we wouldn't really pair this together. They put a very high style Georgian room there um, so the house grows and the house changes and the house has a lot of different iterations and things going on, making it very interesting, uh, quirky, maybe you'd say that, um, but certainly entertaining. Um, but so what I want us to do is, you know, let's start looking at this, this house and tell me the number of unique things you see here. Just speak out. This, so that's a barge board. It's a carved barge board. Okay, so we'll yes, good eye. That's one. Carved barge boards. That's very important. Chimneys. Yes, we're going to talk about chimneys. What else? What's that? The glass. Yeah, for sure. We've got diamond glass here. We've got square glass here. Um, yeah, absolutely. And what we're doing is we are. Uh, being students of the style, right? We're, we're saying, what makes this unique? What makes this interesting? And you, you're picking out the, the carved barge boards, the chimneys, the leaded glass. What else? Well, it's a brick that, that, that turns into this chimney, and it's an interesting way they've done it. 
There is different brick all over this house, and there are different additions that I'll show you that are all over this house. And so the, the brick is very different. Yeah, timbering in the brick for sure, and all different types of brick infill in here. Yeah, I mean, you see the, the, the stucco and the, and the things they put in there. Uh, a lot of different additions, and that would be part of that. What else? When you talk about the size of the glass, are you talking about, like, so... The like indi the individual side, panes. So those are a lot of little pieces with leaded versus on the bottom there where it's mold. Nope, that's leaded glass, too. Okay. Yeah, this is mold, okay? There's the Georgian room, okay? How do I know that? It's a double-hung window. Yeah. Everything else is casements, right? But we've got a double hung window over here. So when it's leaded, you consider that big glass? No, leaded. It, it yeah, so leaded glass refers to the lead caming, okay? Which is those that the thing that separates the glass is called caming, and it's uh, it's soft and malleable, and they and I'll show you more details of that inside, but it's very small. And one of the reasons they did this is so they could be more affordable than these big pieces here. But this is, you know, 150 years, 200 years later. Um, and so the glass quality will really change. But we've got, you know, uh, square leaded glass here, diamond leaded glass here, uh, you know, diamond square. It's, it's, it varies all over. What else do you see? Yeah, the gutters, downspouts. Yeah, for sure. Look at that. It's almost a turreted downspout or a gutter there. Very interesting. Anything else? The house is, I mean, it's pretty symmetrical. Typically, they're not, right? This, this, one, is, this one is a little, little bit more, but that's just the only place you're going to see that because everything else is asymmetrical. Anything else? You guys got most of them. What? Here? Yeah, and we'll look at roofs too. So uh, we'll talk about these materials and how um, they're put together. So first we will talk about chimneys and chimneys are one of the things that are very highly distinctive about this Elizabethan period. And I want you to notice it because this is something, this is an architectural detail that um, some architects will really geek out at and really attempt to uh, match and copy. but. Um, you see this brickwork. Part of part of this um, attention to detail on the on the brick uh, on the chimneys is because of the brickwork. Is because of the firing of bricks, the molding of bricks, and the the elevated scale of the of the masons to be able to make these things. Um, It appears to be decorative, and you'll see more examples of that. And you know this 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 form coming up out of here, and then the breakaway of these different parts and pieces. You see that uh, kind of a interesting attempt at it here, right? Where this kind of mass comes up, and then it, it goes into this this very deal. But this is a um, you're looking at a. Uh, you know, ornamentation uh, as much as function here when you're seeing these these chimneys put together like this, um, and how they're and how they're how they're how they're made. We'll see some examples. You know, this one's kind of a diamond pattern, but uh, we'll see circles. Look at, look at the look at the and you, if you start thinking about how you would make this, okay, and the number of parts and pieces, it's almost like a mosaic that you're putting together the way these chimneys have been built. Um, Look at this decoration at the top here. Um, and so this would have been something that uh, I said, I call it ornamentation, but I'm, but I'm thinking it's, uh, you know, this has been a sign of wealth, just like the glass was. This would have been a sign of, you know, that you have the finest craftsmen, that you're able to, to do finer things here. Um, and even in things like this, uh, where it breaks apart and you've got this separation and they're tied together at the top, it's, it's uh, it's almost showing off, right? Well, it is showing off. How long would it take to build one of those chimes? A couple of weeks. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> through, uh, well, I mean, building the house in this period, uh, I mean, it was it was years and years. I mean, it could be decades uh, for some of these houses. 
Um, but I mean, look at the look at the brickwork there. I mean, um, and you think about each one of these chimneys has a different pattern, a different decoration going on. Um, you see the, the the diamond patterns here. You see this Flemish bond going on. I mean, again, you're you're looking at a, a skill and a craft of these people putting these things together. That um, you know, it, it's 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 a high skill. It's a high deal. If you've been to Hampton Palace Court. Hampton Court Palace, whatever it is. Um, this is, you know, you see some of these chimneys up here and you see kind of the highest form of this art. Um, and, and then I think about building that and realize that each one of those is a brick, right? And so it would have to be, you know, laid out almost in clay, right? Uh, and then fired, okay? And so, um, and then those things would twist and warp and so, they might be using uh, softer bricks with like a molded brick or rubbed brick where they'd actually take and actually shape the brick after it came out of the firing. Um, but, you know, high skill, high art. When you think about, you know, these being individual bricks there, um, it's pretty impressive and pretty awesome. So the brickwork and, um, and chimneys are a big part of this period and this, this style. Windows. Um, I think about building this for a client, okay? And I think about if they say, well, I want to do a Tudor house. My first question is, well, do you really want to do a Tudor house? Or do you want to do a you know, Tudor house? And when you start looking at these details, and I, and I think of my client um, and, and you know, the fact that these, these aren't really laid out very symmetrically, and the, you know, there's, there's small pieces here and these are very uh, rustic, you know, uh, very rustic pieces. And so I, you know, these are set in between the beams and then I, I sit there and go, well, how would I make that so that it shed water so that it didn't, you know, leak? How would I do it? But yet I wanna copy this authenticity and you know, this beam being carved and then these these individuals being shaped. Anyway, I, I start. Uh, you're hearing how my mind is going into this. And really, you have two types, right? This this would be on a simpler house, you know, wood muttons. And then in a nicer house, you have stone muttons, right? Stone mullions. I, they're, they're mullions, the things that are dividing the windows. Muttons are the bars that are in the glass. Like that's a mutton. These are mullions, okay? So, so you have this variation. And one question you have to ask is, are we building a manor house, right? More like this, or are we building a cottage? And so you'll see a, a, quite a bit of variation between those two different pieces there. Um, but think about this house later because we're gonna look at a, a case study and I think they might've come and visited this house when they, uh, when they built it. Um, right, so we've got a, you've got some decisions to make. Um, look at the, the variety of glass here. You've got diamond glass, square glass, you got this decorative glass, uh, all kinds of different patterns and lights going on here in this one window. Is that too funky, right? Is that kind of too much? A little bit. Um, but then we, then we come inside and look at, look at this, okay? This is Do Dorney Court again on the inside. Um, look how this is made. So this is one of the structural members um, and this is crude, okay? So this is something that is, um, if you were gonna make this, you'd almost make it out of, you know, antique timbers that had twists and movement to them. Notice that, you know, this, there, there, there's a piece of bark, that's a piece of wane in the wood, right? So it wasn't like they, uh, you know, everything came perfectly, you know, good from the mill. You can see where they possibly had shutters in here going all over these windows. These bars here, okay, and sometimes people don't understand that, that how weak the leaded glass is, okay, and you'll see leaded glass that slumps, that kind of gets a bow in it and stuff like that. These bars, okay, reinforcing bars, they still use them today, but they have to do that and they weld, see that bar going across there and then this bar going up? That would have been for, to keep the glass from slumping. So these things are, are welded together. There's reinforcing bars in here. You see that one there and this one coming across. So it's, uh, anyway, there, there, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of stuff going on there in that window that 
I'm not sure we always realize. Would some of the uh, <clears throat> different designs in the last picture of the windows, could that have been repaired? Like if they busted Absolutely. Them out and had, they just used yeah, I think, I think this one's a clear repair, right? And, and, and it's, so I read about this and uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, the story in the book I was reading was that this, uh, there was a little bit of a showing off from the owner and a little bit of a repairs and later repairs that took place. But yes, that's a good eye. Just different windows from different parts of the country. This is an historic house we went to. Typically, you'll see these, these uh, uh, mullions being shaped okay and they would copy the shape that you would see in a in a uh cathedral where those the those mullions that come down have a particular shape to them um look how big that bar is it's almost as big as that that mullion there um this is another side of that same window we we're looking at um i talk i i got a picture of this from that from that stob house we worked on what stob did is see the purples and yellows he did in there now, why do you think he would have done that? So one of the things that um, happened in early glass technology was that they never really had the, the, uh, the formulas perfect, right? And you'd have an individual craftsman making glass, and, and, and if they didn't get the sands right, if they didn't do the heat right, the glass would come out tinted green or tinted yellow or tinted purple. And so you have these imperfections in the glass, which is what Staub was doing on this 1928 house. But he saw that in these houses here as repairs happened later, that they would come back in, you know, 50 years later, try to repair it, didn't have the glass that matched exactly. Uh, at uh, Mount Vernon, um, if you look in his Palladian window in the end, that glass has a lot of purple tint to it. So um, glass technology, certainly in America, wasn't even as good as it was in Brit Britain and France. And so, uh, again, subtle things that I'm, that I'm kind of pointing out as far as how we would do this again today. Doors, there are no panel doors in the Tudor era, okay? So you don't start seeing panel doors um, probably until the 16, late 16, early 1700s, okay? So if we're going to copy these doors, um, you know, the, the way to do it is, is with a plank door, okay? And you'll see that a lot in the pattern books of the 20s and 30s, variations on the plank doors. But if you look at these plank doors, notice that those hinges are sitting behind these little uh, that bars that sit over top of it. And so... There are some curious ways that they were building and putting this together that I think add uh, charm and kind of texture to uh, the work that we would build today. But even this one, I think those boards are coming out and going back and coming out and going back. And so I've seen examples of that in some of the old books. This book uh, is especially good for you craftsmen out there. Uh, and we use this book on one of our projects. Uh, tons of uh, details on timber framing, but there's some details on, on how to build doors in here. Um, and some of those doors copy this uh, kind of building detail. So tons of subtlety, tons of, uh, of opportunity there uh, when we look at doors. This is a door, speaking of, uh, we did on a project and what we saw, this is a, a, a door from, uh, I think it was the Saxon period, that they found remnants of. Anyway, it was, it was over a thousand years old. But notice what they did here. Okay, so we got a board and batten door. Okay, so you got the boards and then the battens. These are battens. These are dovetail battens. Okay, so why would they do the dovetail batten? So the dovetail batten, these were let into the wood but it would to keep the wood from expanding and contracting. And so if I have this dovetail on here, that wood can't expand, okay? And that was really the challenge with these, dove, with these board and batten doors. If you know about wood, it expands across the grain of the wood, okay? So these doors are gonna expand a ton this way and almost none in length, okay? So doors, that wood expands across the face of the grain. 
Um, so very little in thickness, very little in height, mostly in here. These were put in there to uh, keep the doors stable, right? But it becomes a really awesome, unique detail for building a board and batten door. At least I think it is. <laughs> um, for and, and adding kind of that character and everything else. Where did we get that? This book, right? We we looked at the past. We looked at kind of how they used to do things. And yeah, this is a Saxon door leaf, right? So that it was Saxon. Um, but learning how uh, from the past really gives us, you know, cool ideas for building today. This is a door I think I've shown it in other talks. But this is, if you think about the, uh, you know, how would I build that today? This door is probably five inches thick, first of all. Um, the panels are linen fold carved panels. It's all bolted together. And look, how, look at the construction on the inside. All these things going across that are pegged and dovetailed together uh, with those huge straps. Because not only do they have a door that opens here, but we have a gate that opens much bigger. Um, that is an awesome door. Richard, you think you can build that door? Where is that? <laughs> I don't think I could build that door. Uh, it's at West Min uh, what did I say, Hampton Court Palace. So that's uh, in a courtyard at Hampton Court Palace. Um, we did a job in South Carolina. We were learning from the past. Um, we were building a board and batten door with, rib, with ribs, okay, which is what this were. Had them, you know, uh, chamfered on the bottom so that they shed water, but pegged where those things came together. Um, a lot of just sexy, awesome details that, that really do make a big difference. Gutters, we talked about, you, you guys identified the gutters. Um, and this kind of lead work, okay, um, was something that was very popular back then. And they, they we can't use lead today because it's, uh, you know, it's just so hazardous and it's, 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 it's poison. <laughs> but you look at the, uh, the way they built the gutters here, and I think these are probably added after, but certainly the heraldry, the names, the, the different things that they would do, is an opportunity, um, and, and really we're talking about opportunities for building better. Um, you know, when I think about gutters on the houses that we build today, um, that is, you know, just paper thin, you know, metal, riveted together, you know, thrown down. If you look at the British and, uh, and, and things, you could climb up the house on those things. Um, try to climb up your house on your gutter. Uh, I bet you can't get very far. Um, yeah, they do. On the other side of the house, they have a big lead cistern that they're, that they're letting the water into. Um, we may be able to see when we look at it again, but a lot of great details here, a lot of cool stuff. These are all, uh, examples of, uh, uh, of historic gutters and, and letterheads and things like that. I mean, the gutters on this thing, the other thing that happens on these historic houses is, is we get all bent out of shape about, you know, a gutter that might be out of place an inch. I mean, look at this gutter, right? The, it comes out of the freaking roof. And then this is a catch here that goes straight across and then comes down. Um, there's another one here, and it goes across the building. They did, for some reason, our eye doesn't, our eye doesn't catch some of those details um, and they and they they really my to my eye appear are are charming interesting details that add to the kind of the texture and the character of the house, um, but it but it, th that's a little bit messy. <laughs> um, uh, I guess they have plumbing. Yes, yeah, so some yeah. You see these coming out of the walls. I mean, think about these houses, and we saw this in Ireland on our Ireland trip. A lot of these historic houses, when they put plumbing in, figuring that's probably in the 1900s, early 1900s, 1920, maybe even later, they, all of these houses are solid masonry walls. So where are you gonna put the plumbing? They actually go out of the house and come down the outside of it. So yes, that's, this, this is where you know, a sink would have been added, you know, maybe uh, toilets and other things. And so you see those things fairly common on these historic houses. Um, here's some barge board details. Um, and, and have you heard that word barge board for the, for the you know, gable end pieces of wood? The carving on the barge boards is a very common uh, 
detail that you'd see on these historic houses. Um, roofs, a lot of clay tile roofs in, in England and, and London. You may not know that. Um, clay tile, there was a, they had a lot of clay here, and so they were firing clay tiles, flat things, flat sheets like this, uh, and a lot of roofs are made that way. I, the, the, what I want to show you is the variety of, of slate, which is another historic product. This is called a uh, stagger butt. Uh, and you see that it's almost chipped and broken. And there's the, the uh, courses are, are, are in varying sizes and things like that. I would really love, if you go, if you go to the East Coast, I was in Maryland uh, hanging out with an architect buddy. We're just driving around this neighborhood. Would have been like Park Hill. You know, of the houses that had a slate roof, 80% of them had a very interesting pattern on it. And so uh, the opportunity for us in this neighborhood or, or in you know, Texas to do better slate roofs is a, a huge opportunity that I think we're missing. Going back to this house where I talked about the repair, notice what's happening on, this, on these, uh, uh, the, the coursing here. Um, you've got big wide coursing here, and then up the top you have very thin coursing. And that tends to be a, um, a popular detail, right, that, that uh, was done historically. They've, this is a 1925 house where they've done the same thing. I get varying opinions on why they did that. Um, one is the thought that it creates this optical illusion of a much longer roof, much bigger than it is. Um, I don't know if that makes complete sense to me, but certainly the historic precedent for doing it is there, and I see it a lot of these buildings. But this kind of the staggered, kind of altered coursing as it goes up, and that change in the size of it, and I've even seen it where the size of these at the bottom are like, you know, an inch and a half thick. I mean, just, they're almost like a pool coping um, at the bottom, and then they get smaller at the top. So uh, again, opportunity for us to be building much more interesting, much more uh, varied roofs. I don't know if you guys followed this video on this house, this 1928 Staub house, but Ludoichi, um, 150 year old company uh, up in Ohio, this was a Ludoichi roof on this 1928 Staub house. And you know, this is the back side of it. Look what's going on with these tiles, okay? Do you see those? Um, that's on purpose, okay? They actually will bend the clay because they're making these out of clay. They actually bend the clay and fire them with a twist or a warp in them. And so uh, to make this roof, it was, it was almost completely handmade. There was parts where they were actually pulling the clay apart at the bottom to give it kind of a weathered edge at the bottom of the bottom of the tile. But, you know, standing back at it, you may not realize what an incredible roof that is. But as you get up close to it and kind of see the variation of what was going on. Now, why would they do that? Well, it, it, it communicates subtly, okay? And this is a layering that happens on great houses. Great houses have this thing that you go back five, six, seven, eight times, you notice something new each time. That's what this kind of layering does, is, is you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, I never noticed that. Wow, look at that. And I didn't, even for me on this route, because we did a number of repairs in certain areas, and it took me seven, eight trips to really sit there and go and take this picture and, and, and sit there and look at it and go, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff that's going on. We actually showed this roof to the Luigi Raft and they're like, yeah, I don't even know if we can make that roof anymore. And so um, because so much of it was hand done back then and their methods have changed a little bit. So anyway, fantastic layering, fantastic detail. And you see me geeking out to little things, right? But all of these things are a 2%, 5%, 2%, 5% that, you know, you do 10 of them and you've got a much, much better house, uh, much better opportunity. Was there a functional purpose in the twist in the top? No, nope, decorative, yeah. So, kind of like a clinker, like a clinker brick? Kind of like a clinker brick, yeah. Yeah, yep, same kind of thing. So, uh, interiors. Um, you know, I, the beam ceiling is kind of a big thing for me um, because we do it wrong <laughs> um, on most houses. In most houses, you'll see the, the beams, if we had a room like this, they might be three beams across here or something. 
Um, this is the way an historic roof should look, okay? Now, why is that? Because this is their, this is their joist, right? And so you have these main beams. These are the, you know, joists, for lack of a better word, and they would have been flooring right on top of that. And so the reason they plastered in between there, from what I'm told, is because the dust would come down, you know, people walk above, the dust would come down through the flooring because you were literally, you know, the flooring was right there. So I show you this because, you know, if we really want to make authentic ceilings, you know, the, the joists and those beams are, you know, four, six, eight inches apart instead of, you know, 24 or 48. They are, they're much bigger. Notice there's two, there's a hierarchy of beams here. You got a major beam back here. This is a kind of major, middle, less, right? Look at the, look at the texturing on this. Look at that. They look like logs that weren't even, you know, squared up very much. And so I would be asking my client, you know, how much do we really want to be authentic? Um, I think that's lovely. I think it can work. I think it's cool, but I don't think everybody really wants that. Um, this is a uh, paneled wall in, uh, at the Victorian Albert Museum in, in London. Um, there's, there's what's called strap work carving, and you'll see it here, and I'll, and I'll start showing you some stuff. That's strap work. Um, if you look at that wall there, there's a pilaster with some strap work carving. But that's something that's uh, the way the English made, the, the English were the, really the only ones who were making walls like this. The French didn't. No one, no one else was making these oak walls that were, you know, kind of paneled out like this. And there's a unique paneling that takes place. Notice this mantle, heraldry, carving, um, and the way it goes, because we're going to look at a bunch of different mantles, too. Um, this is that linen fold panel back here on, the, on that wall, that uh, Dony Court. This is at the Philadelphia Museum. And I'm showing you the variety and the different types of paneling that takes place. But this kind of proportion, right, is about as big as it gets in the, in the houses that I've seen. This is the strap work carving. You see it here. Notice, too, we're talking 1500s. Um, there is a, uh, what would we say, a crude classicism that, was, that, that the English were practicing here, where you've got the pilaster, a pedestal, an entablature, okay, but it's weird because your, your architrave is very small, you've got a big frieze where your decoration goes, and then this is, really isn't a classical cornice. So it was like the craftsman understood and had seen that kind of stuff and go, yeah, we can kind of do that. And they did this. It's just, uh, it, it's an interesting note. Um, and again, kind of the, the subtlety, interesting historically to me, um, you know, why did, why did that design end up looking like that? And it's that crude classicism. This is another historic house. What I find as I go around looking at these, these, these things is all kinds of different ways of making the panel. This is called a mason's miter, okay? Called a mason's miter because the craftsmen, the carpenters learned it from masons. Now, a mason, in a, if he was building a stone pedestal with a panel in it, he would slope the bottom uh, of this deal when he carves it out so that water didn't sit there. Certainly on the inside of a, a building, you don't need to do that, but they were copying this detail. The other thing that's interesting is that your panel mold comes down the side, right? But they had to carve that detail into, the, into that, uh, that slope section. So you had little carved sections that would catch this panel mold as it came down, a very unique uh, way of building, but there's huge variety on how these things were put together and how they were organized. You know, this would be a very simple mantle, right? You have the stone around the inside, brick in there. You know, this certainly is no heraldry, but the, the way they've carved that panel is very unique and different. This is again at the Philadelphia Museum. Instead of linen folds, all of these panels have this uh, I believe that this is uh, these are family and you know uh, cresting kind of things uh, uh, that, that that was taking place there. But you see a wide variety of that. This is also a weird uh, way of laying out linenfold panels. These panels are different from these panels that are different from these panels. Um, notice what's happening on this column. 
got a pedestal here. You've got a fluted and an interfluted uh, uh, fluting taking place here. Um, really no capital, really no entablature. Again, just kind of quirky and odd. Um, and, but, but the way they've elevated this kind of main fireplace thing, uh, again, I would think I'd be showing this to my clients, kind of saying, hey, what do you think of this? What do you, do you like this? Oh yeah, that would go great. And you know, back in a simpler room, not in the main room. And so there's just, uh, I'm sharing the way my brain thinks about this. Um, certainly uh, showing you the patterns of linen fold. I had Vossel carve this. Um, showing the different ways of carving linen fold. Um, and you know, the way they would change these little patterns here, or the way they would change the way the, the, you know, they understand the idea of the linen fold is you take linen and you drop it and the way it folds as it, as it drops down, right? You take a cloth. That's really what we're, what they were trying to show here. Linen would have been a very expensive material at the time, but, uh, you see a lot of variety there. Pass that around if you guys want. Um, a lot of variety in the way that those linen folds are done. Um, talking about mandals, this is that strap work covering, which is pretty typical. This kind of uh, built up stone type uh, um, pilaster there, the way it's, it's being held up. This is kind of a, you know, in between, you don't have the main, you know, heraldry and the, the lions and the, and the kings and the crowns but you do have this decoration and these elevated details. You'll see that we have this kind of, the kind of overlaid, kind of laid on carving on our panel around the side here, but we're, we're looking at the past and kind of carving that. Um, these would be very high level uh, carvings and mantles, uh, but you see the variety there, right? You see very simple uh, with linen folds, very you know, high end here the way they're laid out, all in this Tudor area. Stairs, uh, this is the era before the, the tread and, you know, bracket and baluster that happens in the Georgian period. Um, if there are balusters, they're more like this, kind of the, 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 the fluting that matches itself on either side. This kind of, you know, finial or pendant uh, is very popular at this time, so you see um, the drop that comes down in between, you see this thing that goes up and the, the carving that happens there, um, all part of that same period. Um, this would be a, a typical stair at this time. Um, when I was reading about the English stairs, if you've ever been to England and walked up in some of those towers where you're in a tower and you're kind of doing this stair thing, right, where it's all, everything's stone, this is the... Uh, you know, the, the kind of stair that comes after, okay, is, is that you start having this freestanding hall, you start having a place where you can, you can have this kind of thing. The walls are coming down, you're not fighting wars anymore. And so this type of uh, building was part of a construction method where they would build these, these sections and then they would have to, you know, they would have this decoration that goes top and bottom and so, um, it's a transitionary stair. The next type of stair would be that uh, Georgian or federal stair. The, this kind of cresting is very popular. You'll see this all over London when you go around there. But that kind of cresting in this period, this would be called a screen, uh, where the family would have stayed behind the screen. And then you would have had the, the peons out here um, standing in this part of the room. Um, and then, I, you know, I just... I always am looking at details uh, and trying to figure out how I'd build it. Um, you've got a mix of stone and wood, but look at this here. They've got a stone pedestal here and then a massive beam that goes up and then these spandrel brackets that go across there. Could I build that today? Could, could I make that uh, great for a courtyard for a client? Um, that's the thing I'm always looking at going, how would I do that today? And um, being inspired by that. All right, I'll try to go through this quick. Case studies. Have anybody been to Stan Hewitt? Stan Hewitt? Anybody? Anyone? Um, Ohio. Uh, this was the home for the Goodyear tire and rubber guy. 
65,000 square feet, masterfully done. Um, look at the chimneys, right? Look at the carved barge boards, leaded glass, right? They did a lot of things really well here. Uh, look at that, that little, uh, the way that chimney, that gutter goes out around there. Um, quirky gutter details. A lot of really good things here. Here's that entry piece I was showing you. Hey, re think, remember that? Um, where you have the tower and then you have this entry piece. Um, but nearly everything inside here is, is just incredible. Uh, the Great Hall, of course. Uh, looking back. Um, look at the way they did these columns, these column clusters. Look at how tight those beams are together. Um, look at the size of the paneling, the plank door, um, and how they did that. Just really, really well done. A great, fun place to visit. Um, I talked about that strap work, right? Strap work ceilings, maybe, maybe you've seen this. An excellent way to highlight and elevate a dining room or something like that. Um, this is their dining room. Around the outside, over the paneling, they have the Chaucer tails that, that, that in this, this panel above. You know about uh, English arts and crafts and the paneling that goes up, you know, kind of three quarters up to get the wall. That's where kind of this uh, design and heraldry comes from, um, is, is that kind of proportioning in the room. Uh, because the panels were originally put into these rooms to stop the cold from coming through. And so it would have been part of uh, kind of how they heated and and uh, kept things from being too cold. Great details in there. This is in the basement. Notice the beam work. Notice the stairs, right? They've done the, those solid. This would be a, a closed stringer, right? There's not that open stringer is a later period. Um, but the way they've got that, that uh, kind of strap work scrolling pattern, notice that we've got the same kind of uh, uh, newels that come up, you know, the, the cresting in this urn on the top. Just they just did everything right. It was just awesome. Um, Edwin Lutchens, anybody? Anybody? Okay. Whew. Um, so Lutchens is a 1920s uh, uh, turn of the century architect, early modernist. But look what he's doing here, guys. He is tipping his hand, uh, um, you know, strongly towards this this classic. Tudor house and you notice it in the size of the windows look what he does with the chimneys right he's taking a little bit of a modern twist to that to that chimney design but certainly that that form is exactly the same he just doesn't have all the ornamentation but I think he does that on purpose um, Lutchens and there's Lutchens tours and there's Lutchens houses you can go uh, look at in England but they are masterpieces he also worked with a uh, um, a landscape architect Gertrude Jekyll and um, she did a bunch of the gardens and stuff for them um, but uh, that is a uh, their pairing a number of these houses that you can go look at are amazing um, and hopefully you're getting a taste for w what he was doing um, you know there's that Elizabethan window wall Right, and there's, you know, this is done in wood, and you'll see it done in stone from him as well. But the brickwork, strong thing. Look how he played to that, uh, that staircase design on the outside. Uh, great, great roofs. Um, just, I just, uh, I could look at his stuff all day. I've got a number of books from him, and and the way he does this classical and this ancient together. Um, notice the pegging. Look at, look at the way he does that pegging, and. Think about making that beam, okay? How would you do that? You know, historically what they did was they went out and looked for a crooked tree and then they cut down the crooked tree, right? You know, did he make that? Is that just thin and they cut it out of boards or is that a major beam? It's just, uh, there's some artistry. You know, they've got the, the typical paneling down here, but the artistry of that uh, timber work is just fantastic. Do you guys think this is cool? <laughs> Am I the only one? Um, just it's just magical. They're magical spaces. You don't know. You know they're timeless, right? That you know, is that 500 years old or is that you know 100 years old? And so um, it's, it's it's he had a he had a masterful hand the way he did things and put these things together. But that's really hot. 
Um, and the last case study, it's a job we did in South Carolina. We had some architectural salvage. We were able to match and take the architectural salvage as a uh, design clue for how to build you know, better and do more. Um, but uh, you know, this was, a lot of this work came from the Pabst home um, in uh, Michigan. Um, the Pabst, there was, there, was a, there was a woodworking firm, famous woodworking firm in New York called Herder and Herder, uh, or Herder Brothers. Um, and they were, they worked for a lot of the big name architects doing, and they were, they were, they were a woodworking firm. They had a ton of carvers. Um, and for, you know, 20 or 30 years, they were kind of it as far as, you know, how you built things. Um, but again, you have this kind of crude classicism, simple architrave for freeze, a fluted freeze, and then this cornice here, um, you know, heavily ornamented pad, uh, pilasters here, uh, great beam ceiling, uh, really good stuff. You notice that we, this turret molding is something that we found at when I was at uh, Stan Hewitt, that has a great sexy molding to, to cap off uh, a, a back hall like this. Uh, the groin vault, very appropriate to that thing. This is called a four center arch because you've got these different circles and different radiuses all coming together. A um, lot of fun details, pegging in the, in the, in the woodwork. Um, and this is what we were able to do there. Uh, hardware is a very important. Notice we've got rim locks here. You know, uh, I think that's kind of just the jewelry, kind of the, an, an extra piece that you're able to lay on there that, uh, that works. Um, takeaways. I think that the opportunity to build better overwhelms me. <laughs> um, I look at, uh, you'll know if you watch my videos, I'm always talking about telling a story and a narrative. And what I'm showing you today is making your story richer, right? It's, 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 it's how you infuse better details so that it's just 10 times better and why people want to keep going back to a place because there's this layering in these details that are, that are so gay. great. In order to be successful, I do want us to be students of the past. I do want us to be able to look at the past and, and figure out where to go. I've, I've, you know, there's examples of books, the, the Slate Bible, if you want to see uh, examples of different slate roots, this English carpentry book. There's a whole book on brickwork from the English period, uh, 1450 to 1750, right? It's just the, the, and all, a lot of these good books were, were produced in the 20s, and they uh, did a better job of studying the past at that time than I think we do today. I think travel is no, hands down the best way to do that, and you don't have to travel to Europe. Um, go to Stan Hewitt. It's in Ohio, right? Go, go check it out. Go, go look at some of these great houses where they did it really well. Um, yeah, let's, let's raise the bar. It's, it's time to stop building crap. Um, these are good examples, right, uh, of, of houses. This is 1920s um, of, of ones that were really done well. And if you study these details, that's even a better, better start if you can't go. Resources, this 1920s plan book from Dover. Uh, Dover Publications has published a number of historic plan books, but they've gone out of print. So you might have to go to eBay to look for them, but, but just go into eBay and do Dover Publications uh, architecture and just see what comes up. Um, the design books I'm talking about, there's one called Tudor Homes of England, um, kind of the best resource. It's a very expensive book, but it's, uh, it's worthwhile. Tons of research done in there. And the builders' magazines of the 20s, the architecture magazines of the 20s. Look at the cover of that, 1931, right? Just uh, if we could just build that again, I'd be happy. Um, and this is some of the plan books and some of the details that they, that they offer in these plan books. Um, interesting, Elizabethan as interpreted today, right? Is that Elizabethan? Eh, kind of. Um, but, you know, the, you know what they're doing. You know what they're going for. Notice they've done the chimney. Notice they've done the timber. You know, they've got the windows. So they've copied a lot of details. These are sketches that you find throughout those books that they really understood what was going on today. Realize that most architects aren't trained in this historic stuff. So to go to an architect and expect to get these details, it's very, uh, it's rare and it's hard. Again, just more details 
uh, great details of how um, to build charming, wonderful houses. Any questions? <laughs> Did I put you to sleep? <laughs> um, what's that? Um, no, probably Colonial Revival, which is in the spring. Um, good segue. The, uh, there's, uh, and it's probably because I studied at North Bennett Street in Boston, where we studied those houses and studied those details. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this would be number two for sure. Uh, especially when it's done well, it's, it's just magic. It's magic. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, Windsor, Rockwell, and Kukin. Yeah, go ahead. Nineteen twenty three, the, the owners are right there in front. So uh, and that's a great house. That's a that's a great Ludoigi roof, um, good brickwork, nice timbering, uh, casement windows. Uh, yeah, it's a good one. Well, I mean, um, if I understand your question, um, quick answer is I don't know. Okay, okay? <laughs> let's be clear. Um, the why they staggered them uh, and why they have a small reveal at the top with a smaller slate and a bigger reveal and, and, a, and a bigger slate at the bottom. Well, it would be part of that, but it, that doesn't explain like weather resistant and it doesn't explain like, you know, keeping it dry. I don't think right. um, it seems to be a visual trick and, 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 but it seems weird that they would, you know, 500 years ago, want a visual trick. You know, I think they would have been thinking function. And so, um, yeah, it, I don't know that yet. And so, uh, Yeah. You're gaining shed all the yeah. time. So it would, yeah, so it would be thicker at the bottom, so it would weather more. I don't know. I mean, I've never seen it before. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't really have ice uh, in, in England like we would have or, or heavy snows. And so snow, but not like, like we do, where it, where it, you know, it's the snow would be on the roof for two months, right? They don't, they don't have that issue. Um, Anyway, it, it's, it's curious and fun. Uh, any other questions? Clearly there is a, a love for all of this, and you say let's raise the bar. How do we get everybody on board with raising that bar? You know, I know you and what you love, but you know, how do you make it affordable for people who also love it but may not be able to afford? So the uh, question is how do you raise the bar? How much, how, much, how much time do you have? Um, related to that is market recognition of the value of the detail. Because when you go to sell it and everyone spots it for $70 a foot, the price is the same as every other house in the neighborhood. Well, I think you know, one reason we work for wealthy individuals is because they can afford that and they like that. Now, I don't have a problem working for wealthy individuals because I feel like they are raising the bar of craftsmanship. I feel like they are giving examples and allowing us to share better ways of building. Um, you know, I think if you if we back up and look at building over the last, you know, probably since World War World War II, um, you know, when they were building the ranch style houses as cheap and quick as possible, that had consequences. To that led to the McMansions, right? Led to house styles that aren't a style. They're, they're, like houses aren't a style today. They're, they're gables, right? And so, um, you know, so one, we, we are in a period of time where there's a glut of design, good design in housing. 
my belief is is that when a house is better designed and better better uh, better design, let's just start there. People will pay more for it. You know, people pay more for an Apple stuff, even though the technology, the iPod's the same thing. Remember when the iPod came out? But their design was so cool, you paid more for it. And I think that people will pay more for good design. Now, the the second piece of that is that you have to, uh, you know, I love when craftsmen come in here because I want to encourage them and encourage everybody. Let's raise the bar, right? So that more people can share this, right? And more people can do this. And so uh, how do you raise the bar? Well, it's like turn, turning around a, a cruise ship, right? You don't do it like a speedboat. You, you, you do it very slowly. And so you do YouTube, you do you know, uh, you know, Instagram, and you say, look, this could be better if we just did these three things. And so it's a slow process, uh, but I think it, when it's done right, people go, oh yeah, ooh, yeah, I like that. So I didn't answer your question, no, but, you but <laughs> the- uh, As a craftsman, I'd, like, I'd rather build something like this than a new house today. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've said before, uh, you know, if you if I had, you know, three hundred thousand dollars and go buy a house, I would never buy a new house There's ever. No. It's just they're terrible. Can I offer you something, Brett? I mean, just to help answer that question, it's, it's education. Right? I work for News the One. I spend my whole day trying to educate people on the importance of craftsmanship. So, as craftsmen in the room, it's our job to educate our customers. Hey, you want a house? Let me show you what you really want. No doubt, and and I think people are are surprised that I'm educating my people and my my clients all the time. That's all I do is, is I mean, oh, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. You know, let's, you know, let me show you what the opportunity is and then let you decide. And so, but you're right, it is, it is education and um, yeah. Yes, and the unfortunate thing is um, houses built in the 20s over the years, they've been absolutely butchered. Sometimes, who, yeah. Yeah, who absolutely had no idea what they were doing. And I'm not even talking craftsmanship. I'm talking a basic building, you know, where my, my house as an example, when we started redoing the bathroom, we found somebody had sawed through the floor joists. <laughs> and the room was essentially going like this. Why would they do that? Well, I don't know. But somebody seemed to think it was a good idea. Well, the flippers are, are a problem, yes. right? HGTV is a problem. Absolutely. And so they're not educating. They're, no. they're, they're putting what, a, whatever they're doing. On it yeah. Telling you it's good and it's not. I'm sorry I've kept you a little bit late. You're welcome to get more beer and food. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I'm happy to stay here and talk. Thank you.